Welcome to Middle Fingers Up, the show where we hold our heads high and our middle fingers higher. I'm your host, Kieran McKay. Today we are sitting down with Heidi Denning, a compassionate and intuitive divorce coach with a unique ability to connect deeply with individuals, offering genuine support and guidance. Drawing from her personal experience, including her parents' divorce during her childhood and her own high-conflict divorce about a decade ago, Heidi understands the challenges quite intimately. Fueled by a desire to fill the support gap she experienced, she pursued certifications in divorce coaching, recovery coaching, and co-parenting coaching all in hopes to create a safe space for those navigating the complexities that come along with divorce. Heidi's mission is not just professional, but you can really tell when you visit her uh, socials, her website, it's, it's about being deeply personal. And I think this makes her a valuable ally for anyone seeking a thoughtful and empathetic companion on the journey of divorce and all it brings. So let's welcome Heidi. Hello. How are you today? I am good. Yes. The sun is out. So it feels nice. Sun's out, guns out. Sun's out, guns out. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Hopefully not. <laughs> yeah, not those guns, eh? <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate the weather too. I it was in BC not too long ago. And as much as, you know, the rain and the temperature is like warmer, I don't really feel that way anymore when I go and visit. I feel minus 40 is way warmer than like plus five in BC. Yeah. Just that rain and dampness. Yeah, so, the dampness is gross. Yeah, you know, totally. And the vitamin yeah. D with the sun mm -hmm. is so helpful, right? Oh, yeah. 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 Sunshine is good. It is good for the soul. So I'm very glad. I know that you have a lot on the go. A lot with your schedule. And so I'm really glad when I reached out to you. First of all, I want to give a shout out to my neighbor and good friend Kelly Taylor, who follows you and had recommended you. Uh, and this actually came after I had my best friend on who put her middle fingers up to the stigma of divorce specifically in the South Asian community, but I think many of us can relate to the stigma exists yeah. doesn't matter where you come from. Yeah. And you were so great. You were so quick to respond and we're like, let's do it. Let's get this information out there. And I really appreciated that because I think today's conversation uh, is going to be helpful and meaningful for a lot of people out there that are navigating this, this terrible process and terrible because somehow we've all made it this terrible. I don't, you know, so I'm going to learn today, like, is it possible to get divorced with kids without having high conflict? I don't know. So we'll find out today. But before we get into all that, let's do some lighter stuff for uh, the sake of maybe getting to know you a little bit. I was like, okay, let's do some icebreakers. Yeah, yeah. So I had some like funny questions I thought I'd ask you. So okay. I thought, okay, first one is if divorce had a theme song. What do you think that theme song would be? <laughs> oh my God. Uh, Staying Alive by the Bee Gees. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a really good one. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Something yeah. to do with not drowning. Not, uh, yeah. Yeah. Right? And that's that's actually a metaphor I use all the time oh. is the pool, right? Yeah. Like you jump off the edge of the pool and you're in the middle and and that's the sort of transition area of divorce and separation because it's so uprooting and you kind of get to the middle of the pool and you turn around to look at the other edge thinking it's closer, but you know you have to keep going. Yeah, that's a really yeah. good one. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I use it a lot. Sometimes we add some alligators in the pool. <laughs> Sometimes we throw some things at you in the pool, but yeah. getting to the other side is key and not going back from where you started. Yeah, yeah. I like that. That's yeah. good. So staying alive. Staying alive. Okay. So in your experience as a divorce coach, have you come across any surprising or amusing anecdotes that highlight maybe like the quirks or even misconceptions people might have about divorce? Yeah, you know, like, I mean, I have so many, but I will say I'll go I'll build on your stigma of divorce middle fingers up because, yeah, yeah divorce is hard and divorce is a change and divorce can be 
perceived as broken and 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 all the stigma that's associated with it. I love when we can shift the narrative and help people understand that it's possible that the divorce is part of where your relationship and maybe getting divorced is where you had to go to find out where your relationship needs to be. Mm-hmm. And so anecdotally, I love start I'm really starting to see couples coming to me who really want to start from a place of cohesion. Mm-hmm. So I guess like something that's and and like common goals and and make sure that they approach the kids and the family and and do that. And so funny anecdote is is sitting there with yeah two people who are getting divorced and yeah, like yeah. getting into the thick of their vulnerabilities and helping them stay connected and stay focused so yeah. you know I never thought I would be doing that but it's evolved and I think that's because I am not by any means pro-divorce but I'm certainly pro relationship change pro people evolve pro best self may not have been when you got married yeah. pro finding your your place that your relationship needs to be. Yeah. So it's been really cool evolving that narrative into it's it's okay. There's the shame. We need to park the shame and look at what is and put you two back together in the way. And, and that may be that you don't have contact or, you know, co-parenting is your best foot forward. And that's the relationship. So let's find it. So that's been really fun. But yeah, it's kind of interesting sitting there with, you know, I'm not a mediator, so I'm not like, I'm me, I'm human, and I'm trying to help them stay close to their goals. And yeah, sometimes it's like, okay, I can see that one of you definitely wants to leave this marriage more than the other, which is normal. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Sometimes it's, it's, it's kind of funny. Yeah, I would imagine because like, you're not a mediator. At the same time, I would think if I was in the room with my partner, and trying to f- navigate this, we would put so much pressure on you because I we would need your help to help yeah. guide us. Be- you know, it's like, it's a decision. It, there's those there's those handful of decisions in life that we never want to make, like deciding when a, a pet's time, you know, is to go. Oh. When you go to the vet and you're like, I don't, worst. yeah, right? I don't yeah. feel like I should be making this decision. And I feel like divorce is one of those too. It's like, I would imagine people that have been around that have gone through it, it's, is am I making the best decision? I need someone to help guide me, you know, when we go to our parents and say, should I do this or not? And so I would I would imagine there's all this like pressure as well on you when you're sitting in that room. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it is the guidance. I think, yeah, there's definite pressure, but it's also I reflect back on the person and what we do is do a, a deep dive into their value system and reset their, you know, really look within. And that that's what this role is, not just a divorce coach. It's human connection yeah. and connecting with what is, where where are their blind spots? What are the voids? Is it something that can be fixed or addressed and they can move forward? Or is it something that really is fundamentally missing? And I think helping people understand that that's okay but yeah, it is. There's pressure, but again, you know, it, it's also such a incredible place to be where you can help people with your eyes wide open, unbiased, non judgmental thinking, looking at all of their options, and not through the lens of my. I mean, I'm not your parents. I'm not your friend. I'm not your sister. I'm here to give you that unbiased, non judgmental thinking partner approach. Let's look at your life and your options. And then obviously, add in the anecdotes, add in the frameworks of coaching, and helping them draw out what they really want. And so, yeah, that advice piece is, it's not, you know, coaching's more about having the ability to draw out of the person what needs to happen and, and making sure that they feel safe to you know, as an example, I'm thinking of one client right now who I I really do believe the marriage is moving towards an end. And but the fear of all of that is what we're really working on and the changes. And I never want my clients to feel like, you know, if if they don't take the steps for a while, it's okay. I'm there to meet them where they're at. I'm there to help them. They come to me. I'm there to help them. So if if you know in your heart that the marriage is likely 
not where you want to be, but it takes you some time to move from that realization to actually the logistical approach to that. That's okay. Yeah. That's a big deal. That's it's like a, huge a that's deal. a, you know, in a weird way, it's almost like a day to celebrate because you're, I know you're not celebrating maybe the, the greatest decision, but the fact that someone or people can get to the place and make a decision. Many of us have been in all sorts of I think experiences, whether it's divorce or something else, where you're in that unwavering moment of what do I do? Like you said, do I go back to this side of the pool or do I keep going? Somebody help me. What are my options? And I think that can test, like you said, your own value system. It can test who you are as a person. And like, sadly, people people don't get married. I was just at a wedding a couple of weeks ago, you know, and you look at the work and effort the families put together the stress the bride and groom go through, all this stuff that's happening of like, you know, I don't know if you've been to a South Asian wedding, but there's a lot of us. It's like a big gala. It's a big event. You're bringing families together. And so when you're planning that moment, you're not thinking that's the beginning of this and somewhere down the way we're going to get divorced. Yeah. But if that gets to that place, it's sad for people because you didn't see it coming. You think maybe you did, maybe you didn't, you didn't plan it and all that. But the pressure and the sadness turns into, oh, like just anger. And it's almost like going through the stages of grief. You know, there's quite a grief and loss that we were going to spend the rest of our life together. And it wasn't that one of us passed away. It's one of us is actively saying this isn't working or, or what it may be, right? Like that's a that's a shock in, in so many ways. And I think you made a really good point when you said it's it's not sometimes the act of divorce but it's the fear. Mm -hmm. like, I want to visit that a little bit with you. We know the task is you're going you're gonna to split up or however we want to put it. But all this fear, and you even said park the shame. And I know we all have villages and community members and family members that have a lot to say. Yes. A lot. The same people had a lot to say when you were planning that wedding. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to come out now and have a lot to say should you decide to end this marriage. Yeah, exactly. And I think all of that, would you say, has so much like con like contributing factors to, oh, yeah. to where we get paralyzed or pause in the pool about shit. Is it just easier to go back now yeah. than yeah. to like the unknown of what's going to happen? Yeah. I mean, it's so much of that unknown change. You know, we are wired to stay with what's familiar. Yeah. And even if it's toxic, and it's really uncomfortable to make a change. And that's why I use the pool analogy so much, because it gets uncomfortable when you get tired and you're swimming and you can't touch the bottom. So do you rush back to the other edge and get out and life goes on? Or do you make that tiring effort that's going to be hard. And yeah, there might be some alligators and whatever to get to the other side of the pool and see what's on that side. Yeah. And yeah, the the noise. I say that a lot to my clients because, you know, in my own personal journey, part of what I do again with that approach is your friends and family can only go so far. And I mean that with all the love because they they love you. They want what's best for you. They have their own fears. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at it through their own lens. What are my friends going to say? What are What's my sister going to say? What are my, you know? And so when you can step back from the noise and noise can be your community, fear, shame, stigma, discomfort, the logistical change, and look at your values and your goals for yourself. Like let's let's peel you away from the relationship and let's talk about your your personal desires because you only get one precious life on this planet. And so what do you want it to look like? Do and you have a lot of pause when you ask that question? Like, what are your personal desires? Because like, I, I can't even imagine someone in the the, the pool. I'm going to keep bringing this pool up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm about so to drown these darn alligators. And someone says to me, they, they you know, what are the donuts that save you that they th throw yeah, in the pool? Whatever yeah. it is, right? Put this on, keep going. But then they ask you, what are your values? What are your desires? Like, I would imagine I, I'd be lost. I don't even know where those went. Oh, yeah. No, it's and, and that's all like in the process. That's all about timing. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, th by no means when someone first comes to me and says, like, I'm not happy or we're not happy or, or 
they're gone. Uh, who am I? Yeah. Or it's ended. I work all along the divorce continuum. So anyway, the the point is, it's all about timing. I'm not going to ask those questions. <laughs> totally. And, yeah, yeah. 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 But, but but the question is like, I, I sorry, and I'm not I'm not even I just want to clarify. I'm not even saying why are you I, I'm like, that's an know. important thing. Yeah. And you're right. Like, I don't know how many family and friends would know to ask that because like you said, yeah. their own fears yep. and the people that are going through this divorce that are in the pool. Oh man, I would imagine are dying to figure that out too. But like, oh, yeah. again, the shame and yeah. your parents, your kids, all the things that are making you stay fearful and not go to the other side right. would get in the way. But I think that's such an important question of, where did those values like you know what we started with and you know my beliefs and my all of that we started somewhere and hopefully we evolve and we grow and we take some of those core yeah. values with us we bring some new ones along the way but it's like oh my gosh I, I would imagine you look back and you're like where did all that go oh yeah we started with this yeah. you know like yeah. this beautiful wedding and marriage and all this stuff and now now someone's asking me what are my desires and I don't even know well that brings up like I'm thinking I I mean clients are rushing through my head and I'm thinking this one client so I have when it's when we start to shift to recovery and or so it's kind of at the either end right like yeah. you're in the thick of it but if you're contemplating or some, or it's it's happened out of the other person's choice or you're out the other end of all the logistics and now you're like, who am I? And I had this client, we went through, I have kind of a framework to ask those questions safely, right? Yeah. Like it's again, like you're safe with me to say what you need to say. It doesn't go anywhere, obviously. And no one's judging and it's not going to be reflected back to your family. So what does it look like for you? But to your point, it's, I had him fill out a questionnaire that was a lot about that. Who are you when you're at your best? What do you, what brings you joy? What brings, anyway, it was like 10 NAs. <laughs> and he was like, I think we have some work to do, you know? <laughs> oh, and yeah. it was, but it was really, I was so, I was like, hey, thank God you didn't fake your way through this. Now I know where you're at. And yeah, I get why you're there because we've had a couple of hours already together. Mm -hmm. And I really get that. So let's, uncover and then it, it takes some some drilling down but that, yeah. that's so funny because it yeah. was I use that example all the time I loved it it was oh my god you actually wrote NA yeah <laughs> I'm like what brings you joy like I don't know NA NA it's like allergies right <laughs> yeah. not known I don't know right yeah. now yeah yeah I think that's a I think that's a loaded question but I think that's a an important one when we're navigating through these changes in life, particularly mm -hmm. divorce. So I'm going to bring you back. I'd ask you a couple more questions. Yeah. So if you had to pick a quirky or like unexpected superpower to help people going through divorce, what would it, what would the superpower be? Oh, what would the superpower <laughs> be? Jeez. Let's think. Endless, oh, endless energy. I'm just trying to think, you know, you get to this point where you're so tired, you're trying to be a normal human at work or a parent, and the divorce itself becomes a full-time job. Yeah, like endless energy. Uh, being able to see the other side. I mean, it, maybe that would take away the work that you would do, but I, I had a client yesterday who's just starting out, and she said, do, do people recover? And, and then I have this other client who, who texted me this morning saying like, oh my God, that corner that you kept talking about, I see it. I'm not around it, but I see it this morning. And that's the first time I can say that in three years. And so the two of them, I, uh, yeah, like to be able to know that grief, it, it is a grieving process and you are, and it is a process and it does take work, but you are going to be okay. And if you implement the support and the tools and work with someone like me or a therapist, if you need to go backwards and really uncover the why, that light. So maybe the superpower is like carrying that light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, I, yeah. I like that. I think that would yeah. be... If I was in that place, yeah. I, I or any grieving place, that, that would be a great 
thank you for that. Like, yes, put the light in my head. So I know where, again, the light towards the end of that pool. Yeah. You see it and you're like, okay, I'm going to get through these crocodiles, alligators yeah. or whatnot, because there's that corner that we're turning. So. And finding that strength to, to get through. But yeah, knowing, oh, when she said that to me yesterday, am I ever going to recover? Yes, I promise yeah. we're going to get you there. Yeah. It does happen. Yes, but it takes it takes time. Yeah. It takes energy. It takes work. Yeah. Um, it takes purpose. It takes clarity. And that's what I'm here to do yeah. to help you do that. Right? Yeah. Okay, one more. If you could dispel one common misconception or stigma about divorce with a magic wand, what would it be? Oh, families don't break in divorce. They were already broken because if you're living in an unhealthy relationship or a relationship that's not happy, you're half yourself. It's already broken. Divorce doesn't break the family. It actually can shift the family to find the place it needs to be. So if you're committed to keeping the family as a family, all you're doing is shifting the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So changing that narrative. There are 50% of the families out there that are divorced. Why do we say they're broken? They're actually fixed. I have my own beautiful blended family and we are all where we need to be. And all of our exes and everything, everything's where they need to be. And so it's not broken. Yeah. It's just timing. It's change. And stop that stigma. Yeah. Stop the stigma for the kid's sake. Oh. Period. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, we're going to drop. <laughs> no, I know. I was like, well, we're done now. Thanks, yeah, everyone, yeah, for yeah. coming here. Uh, no, I, I, we're going to come back to that stigma because I, I got kids on my mind, and I'm sure you got a lot of strategies and feedback about that, too. Uh, so why don't we jump into our middle fingers up segment? What is something that you want to put your middle fingers up to today? Well, off your chest. Judgment. I am mm. judgment. Let's get curious, people. Don't lead with judgment, mm -hmm. lead with curiosity. And it was actually my cousin that said that yesterday. So shout out to her because that's exactly what it is. So judgment. Like so what would the difference be for for someone listening that's like what you know, we talk about curiosity a lot on this show. And I think curiosity goes with uh, self-growth, personal growth, awareness, all of the things that we want to strive to be better at, to be yeah. good humans. But it's a foreign concept for many, like mm -hmm. this whole curious thing. So what what would you say would be the biggest difference between me being judgmental or me being curious? You come across a person in a conversation and they say, oh, yes, no, I'm divorced. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Actually, it's good. So the immediate, I'm sorry, like, oh, you're broken. You have a disease. Curious. Oh, okay. Thanks for sharing. If you'd like to share more, that's awesome. But thanks for sharing, period. There you go. I don't have to have follow-up questions no. to that. If they want to tell me more, they can. And often, you know, when you talk like that, often I would imagine many times when we share big information like that, let's say in this case, I'm telling you I'm getting divorced. It's also a test. Because yep. I need to know if if you're ready to handle more info or hear from me. And kids do this to parents all the time. If you ask them, why didn't you tell me that thing? It's because you weren't ready to hear it. And so, yeah. you, you know, that's why we pr we protect each other. And sometimes it's not helpful. So I, I think sometimes people and we, we get caught up in this thing where our own word vomit, our own awkwardness, yeah. come, and we don't like silence, we're uncomfortable with it, all these reasons. And then we have 10,000 follow up questions. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that you just did in that example, I think will hit home for many is the oohs and the ahs. Mm -hmm. You don't have to say a whole lot and it can either make or break a conversation. But yeah. your, ooh, I'm sorry, right off the bat would make me want to not talk to you further. Yeah. Nor would I feel safe to because you've already decided that I'm a victim of something. I Something bad, you know, has happened. My life is ruined. Or as my, my girlfriend mentioned, this guy that she's on a dating app and this they're having this conversation. He proceeds to do a two hour interview with her. And, you know, she's also mentioned, why did I stay on the phone with him for two hours? She did some of her own work after. But it, his word was jaded. Mm. You're divorced. So you're jaded. 
Yeah. And at any time we get into a conflict, it's because of your previous divorce. And it literally is like, that's who you, that's your identity now. You're a divorcee. Yeah. yeah. You, you can be a widower and people will embrace that. Mm -hmm. But if you're divorced, you're, I don't, I can't trust you. I don't know if I can be with you. Can you even handle relationships? Yeah. All these weird judgments that we project and put out there. Yeah. So I, I appreciate you saying like, there's a, there's a way and a tone to respond to someone. Yeah, and I think your comment of safety, you know, in that moment to someone who hasn't come to terms with their own shame or insecurities around whatever it may be that the divorce has amplified, when someone does that, you just feel terrible mm -hmm. and you feel a lot of shame and insecurity. And that's not right or fair because they don't have any sort of information right mm -hmm. and and in that example you know when people you know I share I'm, I'm divorced thanks for sharing feel free to share more if you like that's kind of yeah. you know it's putting the situation between you rather than judging the human for it and oftentimes that's what I'll do with my individuals or couples or families and just say let's let let's look at all of you and put the situation in the middle and how we're all going to look at that and react and respond so we can move forward. Mm -hmm. It does that. How do your clients respond to that? They love it. Yeah. yeah. They're like, oh, because you're so swim, you're swimming around in all these feelings and emotions and decisions. And, and so to just kind of stop, remind them that they're human beings mm -hmm. and put the actual, whatever it may be, if they're approaching a mediation or they have to tell their kids they're getting divorced and put the situation in front of them. And it's like, let's sit in the audience of your life for a second and then let's start to put together the script. And and it's it, it's always really well received cuz I think as humans, I mean as a coach it feels pretty normal to do that, but as humans we don't yeah. and we get all of our decisions and emotions all caught up. It's like you can't make a logical decision when your brain is flooded in your emotional brain. Like yeah. all the blood's in your emotional brain, you actually can't possibly make a logical decision. So let's calm, let's let's reframe and let's reset and look at it from the outside in. And then it also separates everybody, right? So in the example of telling your kids you're getting divorced, which is a huge piece of the work that I do, and I'm really, really passionate about that pivotal moment and how you do it, you're setting the tone. So when you look at the situation and you're and you look at where you're at and how you're going to do it and the words you're going to use not your feelings about it or you you take yourself out of your world and you go into your kids world take yourself out of your world and go into your spouse's world if that's possible i know a lot of, a lot of times it's not possible cuz it's just too much conflict but at least in the kid example you know you don't want to commiserate with your kid or impose your feelings on them you want to go into their world i love that idea and sometimes I'll draw it right out saying okay here's our situation and here's you here's you and here are the kids yeah what I like about that is you mentioned earlier it's dialing that noise down mm -hmm. and and it helps me focus on what am I responsible for what can I be in charge of what do I not have control over? I always feel there's a difference between being in charge and in control. Mm -hmm. I want to be in charge of situations. I can't be in control of anything outside of myself. And I think when you would be in a room full of that many emotions as the adults of the room, yeah, you tend to probably take on your kids' feelings, your all your guilt, all the other things, but not really dealing with the actual thing, which is what are you feeling? Mm -hmm. So I like that you do that because it quiets the right things and allows, I would imagine, individuals to be like, yeah, where am I really at with this? And what's my role in this? Yeah, I see this divorce as maybe something healthy. Now I'm learning my partner also sees it that way. Oh, we have something to agree on. Or my partner sees this as something being done to them. Mm -hmm. We have to figure that out. And Or my ex, or I don't know, however you would word it in that room. I'm not sure. Yeah. But I appreciate that because I think there's a lot from my experience of witnessing folks around me, friends, family, going through it, it always is about everyone else's feelings than your own. And then there's a lot of resentment with that because who's who's looking out for you? Yeah. You, you feel like you're looking out for everyone and you feel that no one necessarily is for you. And those are just some experiences and things that I've, I've seen. I'm sure there's a lot more there. So anything you want to add to your judgment piece about the middle fingers up? I appreciated that one. That was a good one. Yeah. Well, I just, you know, when you, I think just, again, emphasize 
if you're listening to this and you're you come across someone today and you think of this podcast and take a look at yourself and how you approach that conversation are you looking at it through a lens of judgment or are you getting curious mm -hmm. and see how you can learn how to get curious almost immediately and the world becomes a better place and we all become more tolerant and accepting when you get curious about someone else's experience and learn from it rather than judge it. And judgment is armor, right? So if you're judging, maybe you should ask yourself why. Yes. You know what? I appreciate that because I, somebody said to me once, the judgments that we often worry that others have on us are the ones we first have of ourselves. And I was like, oh my gosh, you are so, you know, you don't think about that because it's like, what's my mom going to say? What's my husband going to say? What's my best friend? What's Heidi going to say? All these people. Yeah. And then when you, again, dial the noise down and you stop and you're like, but what am I going to say? Yeah. Oh, interesting. All the things I worried that everyone around me was going to judge me for, I'm judging myself for. Yeah. I don't want someone to see me having a failed marriage. I see that as failure, not winning. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's an important strategy that you're you're bringing up around when we look at it through the lens of curiosity, it does open the door to so many other opportunities. And again, like, it's just the way society has set up the world with marriage is in the the one of the most successful things you can do and that you can go to school, get your education, you get married, you get a house. And then you have kids. And when you don't do the, any of those four things, uh, let alone all of them, you're not really part of majority. Yeah. Something's wrong with you. And, you know, you're selfish or whatever people want to think. And and I think there just has to be so many other ways to live your like marriage isn't the only the only way to do it. And I and I think people are starting to understand that the younger generation is challenging that in many ways. Uh, but when when it comes down to the decision of of divorce at the end of the day, I really appreciate what you're saying. It's like, yeah, what are my own judgments? What, how do my how do I view this? Yeah. And also, now that I'm in it, maybe it's time for me to change that. Yeah. Like, yeah. do I want to go about this process thinking I'm going to be a failure at the end? Because then there's no point of swimming to the end of the pool. That's right. Is there an opportunity, a door open, or something for me to you know? And that that's the hope you know as we're as we're having this conversation. So. I want to add in the middle fingers up segment, have you heard of a weaponized incompetence? Tell me more. Okay. I was like wanting to bring this one up for a while, but I thought, ooh, you might be the, the one to have this one. <laughs> <laughs> so some of you listening may know what this is. So weaponized incompetence, it is a term to describe a deliberate or strategic use of your incompetence or a lack of skill that you're just, you you may not have but it's done in a way that serves you as a person and it serves you know your way to manipulate your way out of a certain situation so the, the best way to do it is I'll give you an example i don't like cooking i hate it i'm not a fan of it but i love eating I come from a family where my mother is an amazing cook, amazing cook. You know, I have my own experiences of why I don't like cooking and why I never learned to cook. There's all sorts of things that got in the way of that for me, but I carry that on and I'm a 42-year-old woman of two children. And every time my husband goes away, I'm like, fuck, what am I going to do? So, you know, he's always like, you can't skip the dishes all the time, Karen. <laughs> like, you, you, you can't do that. And I'm like, I know, I know, but I don't want to cook. I, you know, I don't prioritize it. So for me, the way that weaponizing competence would work is I don't like doing it. I'm not a fan of it. I hate it. So then I would say to my husband, but you do it so much better than me. <laughs> You're so good at it. Yeah. When you cook and I eat your food, it feels like you cooked with love and you really, you make it look so easy. And, you know, so I manipulate, you know, we do this at work yeah. too, I'm sure yeah. with coworkers. I don't, I don't want to learn that spreadsheet. So I might say, oh, you're so good and quick at that. You know, I pivot tables are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so my husband was just away for work this, uh, for a couple of days. And I thought, oh, here we are again. You know, Monday I ordered out and then Tuesday, Wednesday. I'm like, hey, Kieran, 
you can't, you can't, you're not winning. You got kids to take care of. They got to eat healthy. You got to do something. So a few days in a row, I, I challenged my weaponized incompetence and I cooked meals. There was a salad involved and other healthy vegetables that I forgot the names of, but they were all there. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I wonder, you know, as we're talking about divorce and stuff, I, I would imagine these kinds of things come up in, in conversations, whether it's weaponized incompetence or, you know, you know, the, the not so cute way, gaslighting and some of these other things that come up in these in our relationships or day to day. And so for anyone out there that also, you know, is today is like, oh, shit, I do that. Go work on it, man. And tell me how you do, because I'm <laughs> figuring it out as well. Or, you know, just being up front and saying to my husband, I suck at it. I don't I'm not a fan of it. Is there something I can, you know, take up so that you can do this versus yeah. the but you're so good at it. Yeah. Can you do that yeah. for me? Yeah. You know what I mean? Our yeah. kids do it to us all the time. Yeah. But mom, you make that snack so well. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, oh, here we go. Gosh, you're doing it to go. me now. Yeah. <laughs> Get yeah. out there and make your own food. So, yeah. So there's weaponizing competence. Anyone out there, uh, you you know, doing that or having that done too, there you go. Now you can figure out what you want to do next with it. So, uh, okay. So let's learn a little bit about you. So we're going to learn a little bit about you through, okay. So I'm going to imagine your title is divorce coach, communications expert, but let's just imagine Heidi shows up at a dinner party with a bunch of couples and these couples are all showing up with their own, you know, some had a fight on the way, some are in the process of divorce, some are maybe going through infidelity, all sorts of things. Maybe you have a couple of healthy couples sitting there too. And then they go around and the first thing we ask are, you know, each other is, what do you do for a living? You know, so you got someone in corporate oil, someone's, I don't know, a doctor, someone's a teacher, someone's a proud travel or whatever. And then Heidi's turn, you know, what do you do? So like, what do you tell people that you do? Because I would imagine you telling them the word D even coming out, I would imagine a lot of people, maybe even some of the dudes in the room, because uh, even my husband and I had this little conversation about the myths for, for men as well, is oh, are you going to analyze us this whole time? Are you going to figure out, like, are you going to tell us? We have, you know, people get, you get worried. Yeah. Yeah. I have therapist friends that live like, oh, are you going to therapize me all day? Yeah. So what comes up for you when you're at these dinner parties and people ask, what do you do for a living if, they, if they're not already following you? How do, how do you... How do you navigate that kind of a conversation? Just naturally. Um, yeah. <laughs> I tell them, I'm like, I'm a divorce coach. And then usually in that situation, someone will make a joke like, oh, hopefully I don't have to call you. <laughs> See? And and then usually, I mean, if it's a couple's dinner, my husband will be there and he'll say, oh my God, she's a witch in a good way. She's so <laughs> intuitive. At, you know, she's fixing families all the time. And so just by natural, he's very supportive. Uh, he's really like helped me find my voice and my gift in this world. And so he would often do that. And it would probably release the pressure of, oh, God, she's a divorce coach. And then usually what would happen, someone would quietly say, like, what's that like listening to someone's divorce, divorces all day long? Or, wow, are so are you like a mediator? I get that. Or are you so are you a lawyer? Mm. And so then it gives me an opportunity to talk about, no, I'm just the quarterback all in between. And yeah, but it, that's, it. oh, hopefully we don't have to call you. Or, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. we got a fight on the way here. Maybe she might be calling you tomorrow. Ha, ha, ha. Totally. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. I feel like that yeah. that is how I imagine a yeah. dinner party too. And I might make one of those ridiculous jokes too, because yeah, when you're in a room with someone that helps manage high conflict all yeah. day. And again, we just talked about the stigma. You know, very few of us think divorce is healthy. You know, like you you said it really well at the beginning. The problem, the the breaking apart already happened. Yeah. So the divorce isn't going to make it, it doesn't have to make yeah. it worse. Yeah. Uh, it could be the healing part. But we don't think like that, right? Mm -hmm. And we think, oh, stay away. Because I, I remember years ago, should there have been someone in my, our parents' generation, and often it would be the woman that might have left, oh my gosh, all the husbands, you know, and even some of the other friends would think it's contagious. And it's like, I can't hang out with you because you're going to now make my wife or my part, my husband want to, you know, like, it's so interesting. We get mm -hmm. like, it's, again, those judgments versus carry on. Like, why am I thinking that? Why is yeah. that the first thing that I think about? Maybe <laughs> yeah. we need to, you know what I mean? But we like to push it out. We don't like to look inward. So tell us a little bit about, because you have a book out that helps 
parents and anyone, any caregivers that are trying to support children through the process, which is really what I want to get into here, yeah. the kids. We forget about the kids somehow during this process. Yeah. And so tell us a little bit about your book. Tell us a little bit about, yeah, how you, you shared a little bit about your role, but what would you say would be the the three kind of highlights of, of what people can expect when they are in that room with you? How do you become their ally? Yeah. I mean, they can... They're going to expect and receive a human. I'm pretty human right away. And I think that helps put people at ease. I can relate with experience. I have, like you, I mean, you've outlined in the beginning, I've seen it all. I've experienced a ton in my own life with divorce, whether, yeah, it was my, I mean, I come from a legacy of divorce. There's a ton in my family. And my own divorce, obviously, my second husband is divorced as well, because I mentioned I have stepkids. And so bringing that human connection and that experiential voice does help people feel better almost immediately. And then relating to how they feel through anecdote or metaphor and how they're going to feel and what they want to feel is usually what I can get pretty close to pretty quickly. And that's, again, that's from experience. I don't think you could do this work. Actually, I know you couldn't do this work because what do I hear often? People just don't get it because they're not here. Oh my gosh, I actually feel hopeful for the first time. Mm -hmm. Someone understands me. I feel less alone. This is so isolating. You really get it. And so I don't think I could really get it if I hadn't been there. And I do, I don't, I mean, I try not to sit there and talk about my own specific experiences, but I do take what it felt like and where I needed to go and how I got to where I am today and use little anecdotes. Uh, and it's really helpful yeah. for people. Well, and when I was reading up on your website, I really appreciated on there you had mentioned you when you were going through, because you're right, you were a child whose parents went through divorce, and then you had mentioned your own. And I read that when you were going through your own, you really felt those gaps, the things that were missing and things that coming out of it, maybe you could have benefited from or received some help, but didn't. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me, like, do you, like, what are some of those gaps that you're hoping to not necessarily patch up, but maybe, you know, change or reroute? Because I don't think it's a gap that needs to be fixed. Build a bridge. There you go. Build a bridge yep. through these gaps. What, what were some of those bridges that you were hoping would have been, you know, built for you or that you at the time wish you could have done when you look back? So having... And that's really what I set out to do in this practice is to fill the gaps. And that's why I work on the, you know, I got myself trained and ensured that I tweak often to hit the whole continuum. Who do you call first? You've got a lawyer and a therapist, maybe a financial planner. Your lawyer is there to advocate for the law. Your therapist is there to unlock your brain and figure out things, but who's there to walk beside you all along the way? And the one gap I often use is, you know, divorce is very acute. And when you're in, when you're in the overwhelm and the thick of it, and it's foggy, whether it's the change or you're in conflict or you're figuring out that your spouse is maybe not the personality that you thought they were, those moments are really, really hard and are very isolating. So I can think of I used two examples. One, when I walked into a lawyer's office for the first time, I basically was like, so what do, what do I do? <laughs> and she looked at me like, what are your instructions? I'm like, I, I have no idea. Like what? You tell me. Yeah, I'm paying, and you. I'm paying so, you a lot. So. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, I thought you were going to fix it all for me. <laughs> and then the second is like that 10 o'clock at night. Maybe you get a text that throws you for a loop. Who do you turn to? And so those gaps are really acute. And, and so when I say to my clients or anyone who's contemplating or anyone, when, what I say is the first call you should make is to a divorce coach, because then we can meet you exactly where you're at and figure out the best path forward. And whether that is like how, you, you know, how you're going to tell your spouse, whether you want to get divorced, how you're going to tell your kids, how you get organized a 101 of the legal process, who the right lawyer might be for you. What arena are you going to work in? Will mediation work for you? Is this high conflict? All of those pieces that when you're in it, you have no idea. And yeah, I, I wouldn't know where to begin. Exactly. And so you need someone who gets where you begin. And it really starts with the human connection and the emotional piece of it. And then, okay, what are my next steps? So I often with clients will 
guide them all along the way. We find lawyers, like I work with a handful of lawyers that I know and trust. So who is going to be the right fit for them? Then approaching this, I look at it kind of like buckets, like emotional bucket, logistical bucket, legal bucket, and family bucket. Mm -hmm. And those are all the things that we often have to thread. So who's helping you thread all of that? And that's, that's a huge gap in all of those pieces. But I also, you know, I work with my clients from a session perspective, but we also, I allow them to text me because I think about those moments where you're feeling like a shell of yourself. Maybe you got a nasty gram and it's just blown the doors off your anxiety and you need someone to talk you out of your tree. That is unbiased and non-judgmental and not your friend or your family that's like, oh, what a jerk or she's awful. You know, it's like, okay, let's look at the text. Let's let's see it for what it is. Let's figure out next steps. Let's breathe together and let's see what is. Those are the gaps I really felt. I felt very, I have a huge family. I have great friends. But when you're in the thick of it, it's really isolating. And the shame and the embarrassment and realizing every day that things aren't as you thought they were. The conflict that comes trying to be there for yourself, but also your children. I had two very little girls at the time who were just basically staring up at me all the time and I'm trying to keep it together for them. So allowing that just to deflate and be for a second. And I've got a lot of clients like that. I have one right now that's acutely texting me and it's okay because she just needs to be able to not go backwards in the pool, but just even not even move forwards yet, but just look towards the other edge and she knows she's tempted and it's a toxic situation and I know she needs she's going to be better and that light that superpower light is there just that simple simple service of allowing them to text me makes a huge difference and I wished I had that yeah like because you don't want to burden your friends and family constantly and everyone else has their lives and as much as they want to be there for us we say we're there for each other we can't we can't be there 24 7 and when you are going through a grief process like that I would you're right like there's certain times in the day and to me like you're kind of like the other end of you know you think of like a wedding and you have someone supporting you and walking you down that aisle you're kind of that person in the divorce world that's Mm -hmm. sort of helping the person walk down the divorce aisle Mm -hmm. and be there along the way and someone that can look at you and whether it's through a text or what and feel like, oh my God, I'm not going to lose my mind in this moment. My kids are about to come home from school. I got to get it together or whatever it may be that Mm -hmm. people, because I would imagine you see so many different levels of anxiety, Mm -hmm. let alone grief in in how all of your clients go through it because no one's really the same. You have some people that, think everything's okay Mm -hmm. and it's not and Mm -hmm. some that think nothing will ever be okay but it is so and everything in between so you you yourself being there to navigate people through that I think would be beneficial because you had you know you said we're in motion brain Mm -hmm. and I was like an emotion brain you know downstairs in the basement so like who's gonna help me walk up the stairs to get to my logic brain so I can make better decisions yeah what do you see as the most common reasons why people are getting divorced? Is it the infidelity or is there something along the way that maybe we missed or didn't a- attend to? I know you mentioned earlier, like there's lots of growth that happens for mm-hmm. us as individuals. And sometimes one partner is growing at an excessive level and then maybe the other isn't. They're kind of where they're at. Yeah. You know, so what do you what do you see are the the common reasons why people reach out to you and the process of what they're going through? Well, I'll keep it. I mean, I see a lot. I, I'll say infidelity is a, is a symptom of a crack that's already there in the foundation, right? And so what I see, I, I see all sorts. And I think what I will say to help, you know, whoever's listening feel okay in their own shoes is back to your point about society and expectations I think people start to feel that they're not walking their own path and and what that looks like is needs to be discovered or their relationships themselves evolve and change. People change. You know, at the core we are who we are, but we change and grow all the time and sometimes at different paces, like you said, the reasons for the marriage 
you know, there was a funny meme that was like, didn't you see the red flags? And it's like, I thought it was a circus, you know, and people get married because it's the thing to do or the reasons or the timing in their life that they got married. It's like that person checks all the boxes. So sure, I'll get married. Like, you know, there's a lack of connection and that's going to fester and come to a place where all of a sudden the cracks in the foundation become more and more and more apparent. I think when I see relationships that are cohesive and working and I'm that's that you can see that they work on the connection mm-hmm. and you can see when the connection is not there and you know there's so many different scenarios we were we get married when we're young yeah. and we change a ton and life changes or we have situations that are thrown at us that we didn't expect and so I I guess I would say it's individuals who have come to terms with the fact that they're not walking the path that they want to be what that is they may or may not know and we help uncover that but they're just not getting what they need out of the relationship or it is two people that really should never have really gone down this road in the first place but at the time it seemed right you name it, right? Yeah. But those are kind of like, I I mean, of course, yes. And then we see like personality disorders, addiction, infidelity, all of those things also blow up marriages. But what's at the core of those symptoms is is really what the issue is. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that you put that really well. And I would imagine when you because we often, when you look up the stats, right, over 50%, right? But is it, is it like 50-50? Is that what, so what about, we're saying for yeah, divorce? Yeah, yeah it's right? about that, yep. And then you, like you said, you have the complex mental health, addictions, all sorts of things. But it's very rare that we do get back to the beginning of our own story of, okay, where did this start? Because, yeah, we missed signs or I learned, you know, the other day we talked about red flags, but there's these beige flags, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in relationships that were like, oh, I'll, ch- quote, unquote, I'll change that later or that's not a big deal right now. Let's get to the wedding or whatever it is we need to do and then we'll talk or the kids will help us fill the gap or whatever people you know decide and and I and I think sometimes it's exactly what you said is like we get married young and we don't really know ourselves we think that we're supposed to know ourselves through our partner and we figure that out and that's one part of it but then when you're living your life and you're growing or one's growing at a different speed you get to this place and you're like I don't even know myself like I have Mm -hmm. friends I have family members that are like I had no idea who I was, what I wanted, and this opportunity presented itself. And they were a really great person. And I thought we could figure it out. But like you said, that festers and festers and what's at the core. Yet, we often focus on the blow up, Mm -hmm. the infidelity. Or that guy, quote unquote, you know, how often do we use a word crazy, which is like terrible because it doesn't really look great with the stigma of mental. But we say, right, he just got crazy or her drinking got out of hand or whatever it is. These things were there along the way, but we don't, it's hard to go back and like pinpoint. This actually has a lot to do with my own stuff of, of how and where it came from. And when we're living in the world of stigma, you know, for a lot of people to go to the, their community and say, well, we're getting divorced because we're two different people. People would never allow that or accept that. Mm-hmm. You guys are yeah. selfish or you're terrible, figure it out. So you have to sometimes make it a big glamorous thing of she cheated on me Mm -hmm. or he has a reason yeah Yeah. because the only way to connect with you know is like well then you again i gotta be a victim in this in order for someone to and people aren't intentionally trying to be victims but i think that's how we accept it yep you know what i mean yeah there needs to be a show I, i have a client right now she's like you might think this is really weird but we like don't fight we we're just we're good but this is not where I want to be. I'm like, yeah. I get it. Yeah. I really, I really get it. It's yeah. okay. There, there doesn't need to be this big, colorful show. Yeah, I get it, and I understand. So I'm going to uncover the why, so that you feel good about your decision. Yeah, and and I think you said it. You know, the the red flags are not just the other person's. It's you too. Yeah. Where, what are your blind spots? I had no idea who, like, who I was when I got married the first time, and who I am today. There was some serious blind spots that I had, yeah. and. And that's not his fault. That's not my fault. But it's deciding, do you want to turn towards those and figure them out so you can have a healthy existence and know that you're, you're human? Yeah. And... Or turn away from them and not look what's in your kitchen and suffer. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. How would you recommend 
for folks? Like, where do you, how do you get to the place of what about me and what could, what could my flags be? Cause I really like how you said that. And when I've been around folks that are going through divorce or hear about it, read about it, we watch it on TV. Again, we don't start with our own flags. We start with the other person's, but you know, somewhere along the line, when you're looking at a high conflict situation, sometimes we lose sight of like our own role. And I see this where it's the other person, Mm -hmm. it's all them. And I don't know, like I would hate, you know, God forbid one day if this happens between my husband and I, I would hate that he would feel that I'm all the problem. Mm -hmm. Like, I, you know what I mean? So then for me to think he's all the problem is also, you know, there's two people in this relationship and especially if if you have kids, right? Like how do we get to that place where it becomes high conflict and how, how do you recommend to your clients Again, go internal, look inside before you look outside. What is it that, what's your role in this? Do you guys go through that? You talk about that? Oh, very much so. We spend like a ton of time on how, that's what coaching is. It's like, if, if you're coaching someone and if someone is being coached, they have to be open to where their self-awareness needs to grow, where their blind spots are. And if they're not, I tell them. And so I think of a great example, like, I mean, if someone is saying to me, it's all them, it's like, okay, well, that what's your first clue that it's clearly not, yeah. there's a problem there, yeah, because it's never all someone. Sure, they might have participated in, you know, if there's infidelity or addiction, it's like he's or she's the alcoholic, or, you know, she cheated. It's like, okay, yeah, no, that was their decision. And, but let's get to, let's look at at potentially why it happened if you're, you know, willing and able. So I can think of, you know, I had a client yesterday that extremely high conflict and it's so challenging. And so when I work with him, I come at it from what was your role and how can we shift the situation? And so as an example, there's a an app out there called Our Family Wizard that parents can use when it's high conflict and it sort of documents and has an algorithm in it that turns the language to be diplomatic. Let's just say that. So like you could type in my ex is a F in flip in whatever. Yeah. And it'll shift. It'll and be say, like, it'll the just father eliminate. of your children. <laughs> yes. Needs to pick up the children at five o'clock. <laughs> but anyways, and so sometimes what happens is I'm starting to see that this app that has a purpose is being weaponized. So documenting his poor behavior and her poor behavior. And, and so there was a, in this, in this particular situation, there was a lot of finger pointing because she had actually done some things that were not okay. So there was a ton of finger pointing. But when I read through the emails, I said, okay, again, we're going to step off the conflict bus and go to looking at our side of the street and how we participated in the conflict. And I said, you telling her what she did wrong is participating in the conflict loop. I know it's tempting and I validate their feelings. I'm like, I get it. I know it's really tempting. I know she's not supposed to do that. I know how it feels and it caused a ruckus. But you pointing that out, you're the last person that she wants to hear any of that from. Mm -hmm. Like, she's not going to turn around and be like, you know what? Took an easy hit. Thanks. I'm an asshole. And you you figured it out. Thank you so much. Like, no. What are we expecting when we send those kinds of texts and emails? And and so I'm like, you're not the, you're not in control of what her world is. And you need to be in control of yours. How can you show up as your best self? How can you stop yourself from doing that? It doesn't go anywhere. What's productive? What's in the best interest of your kids? Let's start there. But she can't do it. Whoa, it doesn't matter. That's her world. What matters is how you conduct yourself in yours. Yeah. And there's a lot of that yeah. talk. And at the, and I often say, at the risk of pissing you off, or <laughs> uh, I mean this in the nicest possible yeah. way, or are you open to me giving you some feedback that's going to help in the long run? Yes. And it's not criticism. I'm not like, you're an idiot. Yeah. We need to step off this emotion. Well, even so, like it being in the motion brain, right? Like that's yeah. where you're coming from or on the conflict bus, like you said. Like get off the bus yeah. and yeah. wave and let it go by yeah. and then go and tend to your garden. Yeah. You talk a lot on your socials about protecting your peace. Yeah. 
And can you, can you, I feel like this is sort of what an ex- part of what yes. you're saying here is, yeah. can you talk a little bit about what you mean there? Yes. Yeah. And, and in high conflict divorces or, you know, these kinds of situations, we often default to defend ourselves. We often default to telling them what they're doing wrong. We participate in the conflict cycle because of kind of those two things. And we have a lack of boundaries. And so I work with these, within these situations with my clients to exactly that, try to step them off the chaos bus or the chaos coaster or whatever, the mm. hamster wheel, you name it. Yeah. And look at what the other person's doing from a place of, of course, they're doing that. I'm going to carry on and stay peaceful and protect yourself in looking at the long game and what what you want to accomplish in the long game, what matters to you, not them, what matters to you. Protect your peace is about having healthy boundaries. I'm not going to respond to that tone or that text. I'm going to actually ask you to only email me at this email address. I, If you email, if you text me a bunch of text bombs, I'm not going to respond. I'm not even going to look at them. If there's an emergency with our children, you'll call me. Or I see that you made a massive colossal error in our divorce agreement and you went against it. That's on you. I'm not going to try and point it out to you. I'm going to carry on doing what I know is best for me. And it is really hard for people. My natural is defensive. And I know that now about myself. And so it's about that pause saying, why are we trying to convince this person of something that they're A, committed to never seeing and be, what does it matter what they think? And and I think you said this in the beginning a lot. We do get caught up in what others think. Mm. And even your ex that you're in conflict with, that you despise or whatever, why does it matter? Well, what are they going to say about me out there? It doesn't matter. Because you know what? You're holding yourself together with integrity. You're focused on the kids or your mental health or your best self. As soon as you stoop or participate in that, You've lost the respect of all of this work that you've done and the respect of your whole self, yourself, because you did that. And it's okay, we're human and we're going to make mistakes and we're going to, and I can help you unwind them, but protect your peace at all costs. What are, what are we trying to accomplish? Well, she needs to know. No, she doesn't. That's it. I got to, I got to tell him because I'm sick and tired of him doing A, B and C, you know, and, and, and now like we haven't even gotten to the kids yet. Yeah. (laughs) Because, you know, like that's, that's the other part of, I would imagine, protecting your peace would, would be the fuel I would need to be able to be the best mom possible to my children. Well, exactly. And that's really about, again, self-awareness. And so when you're coming in this situation, whether you're coming in with common goals with your soon to be ex, or you're, you're alone in that I'm the North Star parent, this person is volatile or unhealthy or struggling or narcissistic and Ooh, that's coming a, in. We should have a should, shot every time we hear that word, I, know, I bet, right? It's, it's a big word yeah. and it's used a lot, but there is a lot of those types of personality traits out there. So how do you protect your peace? You need to know when you're, so the, the, the kickoff conversation with your children, setting the tone is really about understanding where they're at in their worlds knowing, taking care of yourself in a lead up to know how you're feeling, having the right language around the human condition. So when you have the conversation with your children, it's about understanding their age, their stage, their brain development, what they need to know and don't need to know. Mm. And then understanding that you're human. And if you get emotion, you know, if you start crying It's not their job to make you feel better. It's your job to say, this is an emotional time. Crying is normal. And I'm just having some tears because this is a very big emotional moment. And so understanding how you identify yourself and them in that conversation and then catching them. You know, you said it earlier. It's about validating their feelings. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, who's going to move out? Where am I going to live? It's like I can see that you're scared. I can see that it's confusing. I can see that change is causing you some anxiety. I'm here. 
I've got you. It's going to be okay. Yeah. And not, yeah, I know it's hard. I know I'm so sad too. This is awful, terrible, horrible. Like don't commiserate with your kids ever. And it's about, again, going out of your world and into theirs and seeing it from their perspective and how you can support them to understand that relationships change. Yeah. To understand that they don't have to compromise themselves in relationships either. To understand that calling things for what they are is okay. And if you're set out to, to show them that you're committed to finding the place that while marriage isn't it, confining the place that your relationship needs to be, while they won't, yeah, nobody likes change. And yes, it's emotional and they're all going to have, it does set the stage for an open conversation. And I have had, I mean, of course it goes off the rails and there's all those, but I will say I've had families come back to me and say, whoa, we we had like a B minus plan and we read your guide and our attempt to tell our kids was an A plus. Oh, yeah. And it set the stage for how we want this to go. So thank you. Or um, you know what? We didn't realize this, but our kids totally knew. And it released the pressure. And everyone is like feeling great in our household now because the tension has been released. Yeah. Or you know what? This opened up our eyes as to how to talk to our kids. And we actually had the best conversation as a family about feelings and emotions and saying out loud how you're doing and and what's okay and not okay with you. And our kids, albeit they're not happy that we're getting divorced, they're asking questions like, what's a healthy boundary? What do you mean by that? This friend is doing this to me. Can I end the friendship? Like it becomes a learning. Yeah. And 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 life is change and there are no guarantees. And so it helps kids learn and and I I hate the expression kids are resilient. <laughs> no, that's why adults are all in therapy. Thank They're resilient you resilient like, cuz they have to be sometimes. They, <laughs> they aren't resilient. They can build resiliency skills. Yeah. And so this is one way that it's like either you have a choice. You can make this terrible and awful and break everybody and their collateral damage and they're the broken family, or you can use it as an opportunity to help them continue to learn and grow and be capable humans in oh, this yeah. one precious life. I, I I appreciate those. When I told you earlier, when I when I was at my previous job, I was managing 12 to 17 year old kind of in crisis programs. And all of the programs that I ran, my referrals came directly from the hospital. So young people that came to the hospital for suicidal ideation, self-harm, were safe enough to not be admitted, uh, yet they still needed some work. So they'd yeah. come over to our side through the hospital. We'd do work. We'd have therapists. We'd have family support counselors that would go in the home to help them settle in, all sorts of things. And I did a little research project, took a bunch of the stats for three years through my programs, with the research department and the thing that stood out, my, this was in 2018 and I bet you it was just new numbers. It'd probably be very similar. We looked at just a correlation of the top three presenting concerns. So suicidal ideation, mm -hmm. self-harm, anxiety mm -hmm. uh, were some of the top ones. And what were the things that link them to why they mm -hmm. came? Mm -hmm. And it was so interesting. It's a program that works with highly anxious young people. And yet... There, there were very few diagnoses, like kids coming to the hospital being diagnosed with anxiety that were there, but almost all of my kids that were, would come in had a high percentage of parents going through divorce and separation, and the link to anxiety was there. Interesting. So all the kids that had parents going through separation divorce, they automatically had anxiety-related diagnoses that brought mm -hmm. them to the hospital. And these are kids age range from 12 to 17, mm -hmm. sometimes a little bit younger. And to, to me, the thing that stood out so much with all of that and part of why we're talking today is like we miss this as the adults in the kids' lives. Mm -hmm. we, we miss, you know, like you talked about resilience. Resilience is a, sometimes a really good avoidance coping strategy. Mm -hmm. And our kids are trying to please us constantly. And I'm not trying to make anyone feel guilty. And I know no, I, not I'm not all. someone that's gone through divorce. So this isn't like, oh, you know, but just being on that side and seeing in the work and these kids, all they needed were, were the two people that promised them safety in the minute they were born. 
They just needed those two people to get their shit together for a little bit mm -hmm. so that these kids could go through, you know, the process of the divorce. Because these some of these high conflict divorces that were happening were years in the mm -hmm. making. Yeah. You know, so parents like have zero money left going through the court system. There's always something new going on. And it was fascinating to hear how many sidebar conversations the staff would have to have either with the mom or the dad about Mm -hmm. Don't talk to the other parent, they're a narcissist, or don't take everything that they say, you know, this mm -hmm. isn't really how it goes down. But we would say, first of all, transparency is key. Yeah. So we're not doing sidebar conversations, but also like your kids see all of this. Mm -hmm. They feel all of this. Yeah. And like you said, many times they know yeah. that this is going on. My kids know my husband and I have a fight no matter how hard we try to pretend we do. You can just, when you live with someone, yeah. it's very, you know, like I know the things my kids are doing because I live with them. Why wouldn't they know the things that I'm doing? Well, and and you can always frame it, right? So I would say to parents, um, you know, if if it's gone off the rails or start today, and think about how you can validate how your kids are feeling, understand what they can cope with and understand at their level, and start there. Um, and hey, everyone fights. And I often say, <laughs> you know, like there's a difference between everyone fights and debates and we're humans. We're not going to get along all the time and that's okay. Totally. So, you know, if your kids are seeing you fight, it's like, yeah, of course we do. It's healthy debate. It's healthy. It's it's good. We'll come back together and figure this out. Yeah. But we're going to get at each other. That's normal, just yes. like you and your brother do, or whatever. And that because then that takes out the anxiety. But I would say, yeah, those those presenting anxious conditions of these kids of divorce are because they likely had to. And parents don't know. But right? that and sorry, yeah. and that was a point <laughs> that I was getting to was. The parents didn't recognize no, that no. because they were so, like you mentioned, the noise, right? Yeah. They were so caught up in the noise. And, and you know, you think of what are the underlying betrayal, yeah. you know, like you're let down, it's betrayal, justice, all these things that we're fighting for often turn into this yeah. not, not so great fight because we're being nasty and it actually hurts me more when we interact, even though I'm trying to get you to apologize to me or whatever it is that I, you know, like, I guess the best way to say it's all this unfinished business yeah. of however many years together. And, and you know, like it, there, some people obviously feel it's unfair. And my I had no clue that my partner came to me and said, I want a divorce. Like it, for a lot of people to shock and the work that you're doing is let's go backwards and, mm -hmm. and look at where that shock's coming from because there's probably the beige or red flags and yeah. things along the way, as you have mentioned. But back to the kids, you know, we mentioned safety before we talked, but also safety in this conversation. And so, you know, I, let's say there's this, we're in high conflict, we're going through this process, we have kids, you're, you've started to mention ways that we can figure out our stuff so we can come and have that conversation with our kids. Um, where, where in all of this, what kind of safety are you hoping, or are you teaching some of your clients when it comes to how we're going to do this process with our kids? Like we talk a lot about safety. What does that mean in these conversations when we're going through a divorce? Safety constitutes not just physical safety, mm -hmm. emotional safety, what your kids can and can't cope with based on their age and stage psychological safety, what they should know and not know. They yeah. don't need to know the details of why. That's between you and your spouse. As much as some parents are motivated to, you know, I'm going to tell them that you're ending this marriage and blowing up our family. They think that that's going to serve them or the kids. It's not. It, it, all you're doing is damaging the kids, not your ex, period. So physical, emotional, Psych emotional is validating their feelings, going into their world, keeping your feelings out away, keep the conversation about what they see and feel. Psychological, spiritual, mm -hmm. financial, right? So those five areas are often what I talk about in terms of safety and we'll use them all the time. How do we get emotionally safe in that moment of telling your kids? How do you stay psychologically safe? How do you understand financial safety and what life is going to look like for them? And how do you connect with them spiritually to understand what matters to them in their spiritual world? 
safety is those five yeah. things. And I talk about it all the time. In fact, I have often clients being like, oh my God, the word safe, you use it in every <laughs> other sentence. But it's like, if you don't feel safe, the ground shakes under you. And that's what causes anxiety for the kids. So the divorce situation is going to shake the ground under them. So how do you keep them safe? And, you know, I use this method with my families. Kids need that keeps them emotionally and psychologically safe. Kids need unconditional love, you know, and it's like, I'll hear, oh, you tell them that you love them and it's not their fault. No, it's like unconditional. We love you so much that we are committed to making sure that you feel as little of this as possible. Unconditional love, safety, emotional, psychological, Mm -hmm. physical, spiritual, financial, I'll say it over and over again, having the conversation that is age appropriate with content that is appropriate and a sense of belonging. Our family is still a family. We all are connected. You are still in the family. It's just shifting into two homes, but we are still your parents. This is still going to be a family. It's just going to logistically look different and your parents' relationship is going to change, not yours. Yeah. So when you talk to your clients about these strategies, is it for some, is it hard to meet you there and sometimes. be there? Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes there it, it takes more work of that. We need to unwind your anger and resentment because you cannot bring that into the conversation with the kids. And I know you don't see that right now. You feel like they need to know that dad cheated or mom cheated or whatever. You feel like you need them to know that dad's leaving or mom's leaving. We need to work on the why because your job as a parent, I often use this too, is like the divorce will cause a wound. Addiction causes wound. It will cause a wound. It's your job as to how you're going to dress that wound and keep it as as healed as possible. And so if you're going to come and tell your 13-year-old daughter who is adores her dad and they have a great relationship that he cheated on you, that's going to blow her world up. Well, because he cheated not on her. You. Exactly. Right? Exactly. That's, you don't, yeah. Well, that's who he is. It's like, no, that's not who he is to yeah. her. Get out of your world and go into hers. That's very, yeah. And I can, and I can empathize with, in this oh, situation, totally. with a woman that, you know, like, I hear you, but yeah. yeah, like that's, that's, this is why we're having this conversation today is the voice of those kids yeah. on those demog- the stats that I, you know, or in the homes that we see. Or the kids that grow up and have a very skewed understanding of what men and women are should be because of our adult herd that was projected on. Okay, I'm going to pause that there then. We can do a part two. Okay, we could do a part two. Okay, so why don't, I'm just going to do like one quick thing with you. We kind of started the conversation about the high conflict and turning into the kids. Yep. And we're going to we're going to come back and take this conversation further with the strategies and how to have these conversations with the kids. So what we're going to do right now for today's episode is just pause the rest of that and I'd like you we leave our guests with one thing, a call to action. What's one thing until we have you come back for part two that people can go think about or do or practice that could be beneficial leading up to our next time together. You know what? I'll just keep it simple. Get curious. Get curious about yourself. Get curious about your kids and see what you can see and note it because when we go with an open mind, we learn. Yeah. And and if you're in a situation where you're listening to this and you're thinking, oh, God, I've totally broken my kids. No, you haven't. You can always fix it. Get curious. Take the advice. Get curious about yourself and get curious about them. And I would say, secondly, if you are feeling emotionally disconnected from your kids, figure out a way to go sit with them. Not your world and their world, just purely in their world world and see what you can find out. Oh, I like that. Thank you.